Okay, perfect. Well, that's good. This will uh, get us this record. It's easy to put the slides to it. It's the recording that counts. So, okay, let's start with a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity to meet with you today. Uh, as always, we ask that you send the Holy Spirit to open our minds so we can comprehend some very interesting but technical information. And we know that you have promised to send him, and we ask for it now. Amen. Okay, today we are looking at the plan of salvation, part one, Christ's life. Everything that we've talked about up till now, I've just been digging a ditch for us. And it gets grimmer and grimmer as we go along. So it's time now... Uh, to find out what it is we can do about this problem. I think we've got a good picture about the problem. It's enormity. It's very complex. And we are going to need to do something. If, we, if something isn't done for us, we are definitely doomed. So the last four lectures, starting today, we look and see what God has done to correct the problem. Well, actually, the next three lectures. The fourth one the last lecture that I give uh, it will be about what happens to those people who turn down God's gracious offer. And that, of course, is very, very important because God can win everything in the universe's PR battle between him and the devil. But if what happens to God's children who refuse his gracious offer uh, is so very important because of God doesn't handle that exactly correctly. He'll lose the war. Now, today, we're going to start with Christ's life. And, um, and as far as review, it says the Ten Commandments were not arbitrary rules God dreamed up to see if humanity would listen to him and obey. Rather, they described the behavior that the mobile genetic elements would encode via new brain circuitry. All God was saying in the Ten Commandments is, you guys have taken an upgrade on your information system, and these are the ten areas where you're going to start being predisposed to, to behavior. And this behavior is a signal to you that you definitely have the mobile, the I. I shudder to call the word disease because people don't like to think of sin as disease, but we're going to find out God talks about, Christ talks about sin as, as disease in Mark 2. We'll see that next week. But um, you've been infected with this problem. And now these, the Ten Commandments are a clear uh, instruction to you that you need to do something about it. They're a it's a diagnosis chart. In this paradigm, engaging in behaviors prohibited by the Ten Commandments results in strengthening and in and an increase in the influence of the mobile genetic elements on the brain circuits. Remember on lecture three, we talked about how the neuron, the nerves, the, the central nervous system, the neurons there, over two-thirds of them have something called anapoloidy, which means they don't have the normal number of 46 chromosomes. They either have 45 or 47. Remember we talked about that? Virtually two-thirds of our brain neurons are markedly defective. And if you have defective circuits in your computer, what happens? Doesn't work, right? Well, our system was so wonderfully made by the creator that the system still works, but it's defective in what it does. It's defect we, we will come to defective conclusions we're going to get more into that today. The fourth and the seventh commandments have been under constant attack by the adversary. Both commandments deal specifically with channels of information transfer and were instituted by God to be a special blessing to, man to mankind. None of the other commandments deal with information transfer channels to such a degree. Remember we talked about last time that the devil picks out, especially for, uh, for uh, most of his... Uh, energies to try to take over humanity, he has gone to commandments four and seven. And because those two commandments deal specifically with specific systems in our brain and uh, uh, where information transfer 
occurs. Remember we talked about on the fourth commandment that the uh, information transfer on Sabbath, we postulated, was uh, the ability of the mind to communicate with God was enhanced. And then on the seventh commandment, it was the communication between you and your spouse. These are wonderful channels that God, are, are systems, not channels. These are wonderful systems that God put into the human brain to allow the transfer of information. And we're going to talk about in the last lecture uh, on this, at the end of this series, about, again, about information transfer. Remember we started in lecture one about information and information theory? Well, it was actually lecture two. Well, we're going to end up there. You're going to find out that the transfer of information is where all of the action in our universe is centered on. So these two special channels that the human, uh, that God put into our human system to allow for specific information transfer are extremely important. They're critical to our happiness and they're quit critical to our well-being. So is it, is it any type of a mystery that the devil would zero in on those two? The fourth commandment seeks to guard the special information transfer between God and humanity. The seventh commandment seeks to guard the special information transfer between a husband and a wife. Disruption of either communication pathway spawns dysfunction and unhappiness. And I could add another caveat to that. It energizes and increases the mobile genetic elements. We're now going to look to see, we've looked in the past about what went wrong, and now we're going to turn our attention to how God fixes this seemingly impossible situation. We have two questions we need to start out with right off the bat before we get going. And the two questions are this. One, why did God wait so long to have Christ enter the world to work out our salvation? Here's simple. Why didn't after Adam and Eve uh, ate the apple and... God came down and confronted them, and Adam and Eve said, oh, we're really sorry, we won't do this again, can't we have a redo, can't we take a mulligan here, we'll, we, we will really listen more carefully to you next time around. If that was what the problem is, and if it's Christ's death is the antidote to this, and usually people look at it as an exchange mechanism, why didn't Christ come down and say, okay, if you're really sorry, but I, we have to have a life has to be um, shed in this whole transaction because of what you did to prove that God's law is immutable. And therefore, what I, what, why didn't Christ just do the sacrifice there in front of them? And we'd be none the worse for wear. The devil would still be around and he would have to be taken care of. And we don't know exactly what God would have done, but we would have been out of the picture. If all we needed was Christ's death, wouldn't that be a good opportunity? Think of all the suffering and ah, the flood and all the other things that have happened. He could have avoided all of that. Seems pretty simple. Adam and Eve were sorry. That's the prerequisite, right? Well, they were there. They were sorry. Please forgive us. Well, someone may say, well, but sin, the, the re uh, breaking God's law, had to allow to grow and completely um, show all its colors. All right? I, I'll buy that. When would, when would the next most perfect time for God to have, uh, for Christ to have come down and paid the debt, wouldn't that have been right before the flood? It had really shown all of its colors then, correct? In fact, it was so bad, only uh, Genesis 6 says only Noah was right in the sight of God. So that means the, I don't know how many people, hundreds of millions of others that were on the earth at that time, because remember, they all lived into their eight or 900 range, so, and they had many, many children. So the numbers that could have occurred in the first, say, 2,000 years before the flood would have been astronomical. So there was probably maybe in one or two billion people. You have one person out of, let's say, a billion? Those aren't good odds. Pretty bad. And they were, the, the Bible says their imaginations were evil continually. 
this would have been a perfect time, don't you think? Have Christ come down, do the exchange to have Christ sacrifice himself and turn things around and save the cataclysmic catastrophe of the flood where the mass, uh, the amount of life that was wiped out was massive beyond our comprehension probably right now. Wouldn't that have been the perfect time? Evil has shown itself to be what it is, but he doesn't come. And also we're starting to run into another problem. A lot of people have lived now, and Christ has not come to do the things he needs to do. The more people that live without the information that we're going to get from Christ's life, doesn't that put them at a study disadvantage? Wouldn't it be better for God to bring Christ in on this picture sooner rather than later? 4,000 years later, give or take, to be exact. Why? Why wait so long? Question two, if Christ came to this world primarily to die in our stead and trade his death for ours, why did he go through birth and childhood? Why not have him come down as adult, die, and return to heaven? Makes sense, doesn't it? If all we're looking for, and if you look at most of the religions today, they, they key in on one thing, Christ's death, that's it. Or resurrection, those two. That's it. That's all they want to look at. The rest is just details. Not important details. So why wouldn't uh, Christ just be able to come down the father demands a life in return. They make a deal. Christ says, okay, I'll give my life because it's worth so much more. It's worth to cover all of theirs. And God the Father says, well, okay. I guess I'll accept that. And then what, why not just have Christ come down here and do that? In fact, he could have done it in heaven, really. If this is just the transaction, why not have it done there? If all we're looking at is a trade-off here, Christ is going to trade his life for ours. Then the death needs to occur, but it can occur anytime, right? And the sooner the better. I think the answer to both questions is that God is magical. He cannot tell lies like Satan can. You have to allow the progression of sin so that not only mankind, but the unclean world could see not only what was meant by death, but that it is possible for someone who is connected with God to live a perfect life. I agree with you. The only place where I'm going to, where I would push you further is that we've had plenty of all of that up to before the flood. We've seen wickedness in its extreme. We've seen Noah. We've seen Methuselah. We've, we've seen both sides of the argument. If God is waiting for more evidence, I don't know what more evidence he needs as far as to show what his kingdom looks like and what the devil's kingdom looks like. The more evidence that are going to be seen is just going to be redundant. It's going to be, you know, I, I don't think Auschwitz has taught us anything that we already didn't know. When you could have gone back to the Inquisition in the Middle Ages, they're the same. It's just new characters with new implements of torture. So let's go on. Why did God have to wait for Christ to, um, why did God wait so long to have Christ enter the world to work out our salvation? Well, there's an important text that tells us something that we need to look at. It says, but when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman, made under the law to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. The term there in Greek in the fullness of time is a, is a, is a saying which they used when the figs were perfectly ready for harvesting. If you harvest the figs one day too early, 
they're not quite as sweet as they can be, and one day too late, they, they begin to uh, turn on you. And so the Greek term here is that perfect time when, they, when ex it was exactly right to, to um, harvest the fi figs, and it's applying that to when God chose for Christ to come. So Christ came at exactly, precisely the perfect time in our history. Even though it's 4,000 years into the conflict, into the battle, and some of the information he is going to provide by his life and his death would have been quite nice to have had earlier, there must be a overriding reason why God decided to wait. And all that dwell on the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Now here's an important characteristic. People wondered, well, how is it then that the people prior, I mean, the people that lived, the humans lived prior to Christ coming to the earth, were they still covered by the plan of salvation? They lived and died, and Christ hadn't come down and done what he needed to do. What we have to remember is that God is outside of time. He creates time as a, as a uh, dimension. We live in four dimensions. And he creates time as the fourth dimension. As the creator, he, he, can, you know, uh, he can stand outside of it. If I sit up here and make a clay resemblance of myself... I'm not in, I, I may have, I have made the clay, but I'm not in the clay. I have maneuvered the clay, but I'm not in the clay. I'm above it. And so what this tells me is that God, as I would expect, is not hampered by the dimension of time like we are. We always, we go in one direction. And I think God can go, he can stand outside of this long continuum and he can do what he needs to do at any different point in time. So from realities, from God's perspective, Christ's death, he was working on the information from Christ's death, in my opinion, from the beginning. Because it said he was slain from the foundation of the world. Now, you've seen this uh, before in Lecture 3, and it's just a reminder that there are multiple large families five really to be precise, of mobile genetic elements. And they all didn't come on the picture, I mean on the scene at the same time. The first ones to come in were the DNA transposons. And then we had the retro transposons. Those are, those are made out of RNA. And they are autonomous, means they, they bring in with them all of the special enzymes that they need to help them take over the genome and control it. And then down here at the bottom, we have uh, the non-autonomous, which are the ALUs and the signs and the SVAs. Uh, those two require information that's already been brought in by the autonomous ones in order to work. Okay? And this is giving you an idea of, uh, it's also a timeline. They all didn't come in at once. They've been coming in over a period of time of history. Um, Christ has to enter this battle when the devil has brought all of his weaponry to bear. If Christ would have come in right outside of the Garden of Eden, and i got to be careful here, I can't get too technical. If Christ would have come then, much of the genetic code changing that the devil was going to do hadn't occurred. And the different ways he was going to change the code hadn't showed up on the screen. For God to allow, the gods are going to allow the devil, remember, he's in this, he's got to allow the devil to play his hand to the full. Otherwise, God will be uh, brought up on charges of calling the game before the end. As an illustration, when I used to, when I was dating my wife, we liked to play this board game called Risk. I don't know if you are acquainted with it, but it's, it's a way to take over the world. And back then it was made of, out of, with real wood pieces. And, uh, and we, we greatly enjoyed that game, uh, although 
it did lead to um, we were both competitive, so it was not a um, it was not a harmonious exercise between us by any stretch of the imagination. And oftentimes I would come over to her house. That would be our date. We'd get the risk board out. We were in high school, and we would start to play. And she had a little dog by the name of Pretzel, which was a little miniature dachshund, dog sound. And we would play on the floor, and we would have our pieces. And when it became clear that I was going to win, she would signal her little dog to come over, and she'd have a treat, and the dog would run right across the board and mess up all the pieces. <laughs> you can see this didn't have at the beginning a lot of promise for a harmonious marriage. Well, we're still married, and you know, everything's fine, uh, which, of course, sent me through the roof. The devil could have said the same thing about God. You're calling the game. You're, you're bringing pretzel in to mess up the board just as I'm winning. And the rest of the universe would say, maybe he's right. So God is going to have to step back and say, I'm going to allow you to, to do whatever programming, institute whatever programming ideas you have. We're going to let them come onto the table. And Christ is not going to come to to uh, pick up God's part of this and pushing back until the devil has instituted all of his weaponry. He's had a full chance to play his hand. He can't claim to the universe, God threw the game just as I was winning. God says, go ahead, put all your pieces on the table, and I'll wait. And why is this important? Because Christ was given some instructions, and he says, and this is the Father's will which has sent me, that of all which he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. That's another way. This is John 6, 39. This is another way of saying Christ has been his job. When he comes down to this earth, he has to find a way out of this coded code mess that the devil has put us into. And what the part of the instructions are, I don't care how bad the code has been hijacked, you have to find out a way to get people out. The, wor the person with the worst infestation of mobile genetic elements, you have to find out a remedy for that person. So it's not just we're going to get 90% here. We're going to try to get the, the, the vast majority. He has to come, and when he comes, he's got to institute a way to get everyone. And that includes Adolf Hitler if he wants, if he wants to change. Or it's Stalin. Any of those names that you want to think about. God, Christ had to come with a, a plan that could rework their information system no matter how far they had been in league with the devil and no matter how much the devil had been able to rewrite their information system. Why he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come to him by God, seeing he ever lives to make intercession for them, Hebrews 7.25. To save to the uttermost means I can save Christ can save anyone, providing they cooperate. But if, any, if every, anyone that co cooperates with them, he can rework their genome and get it back. So therefore, he's going to have to come when humanity's cumulative genomic pool is the worst. Right? Right? How is he going to get combat this? Because he's going to take on this. He wants to take it on in its worst possible condition because his instructions are he's got to be able to bring everyone that wants to come out of this mess back to the kingdom, back to God's throne, and become a member of God's kingdom forever. And here is a... What I was trying to tell you earlier, it says waves of retro transposon expansion remodel genome organization and the CTCF binding in multiple mammalian lineages. The CTCF is just a fancy word for some special gadgets inside the nucleus, which 
which are like, um, oh, they're like big rubber bands. And what they do is they'll take one of the chromosomes, say chromosome 13, and they'll bring it over right next to chromosome 3, and they'll actually bring it right next to chromosome 3 and 13 so that a special part of that chrom those two chromosomes come right up to each other, and they are transcribed, and that makes a new protein. So it's not just having your genetic uh, uh, protein coding areas, which we call genes, that are approximately 21,500 of them. You have to realize they can all be matched. They can all be, um, they're like components, Lego blocks. You can, you can um, mix and match them. You can make new structures with them. They're not constricted to exactly what is coded there. You can bring in another coding area, and you can overlap them and come up with a brand new messenger RNA that isn't possible without bringing those two right together so they're read simultaneously right across seamlessly. So it's a very complex system. And it says, taken together, our data support a model in which lineage-specific repeat expansions. Remember, you, whenever you see the word repeat, think mobile genetic elements. So I'm going to put that word in there. Taken together, our data support a model in which lineage-specific mobile genetic element expansions have been propelling distinct, and again, the CTCF motif, motif words and their associated binding events across the genome. I underline this many times throughout mammalian evolution. In other words, we've had infestation after infestation after infestation of these mobile genetic elements. And you know what? There has to have been a lot. Two-thirds, maybe as much as 85% of our information system is now made up of these guys. So we've had to have multiple infestations to get there because not all of them stick. If Christ came to this world primarily to die in our stead and trade his death for ours, why have him go through birth and childhood? Why not have him come down as an adult, die, and then return to heaven? Okay? Now, this is question number two. I just finished question number one is... Why did God wait so long? And now I pose the other question, which was, why did Christ have to go through being born of a woman, childhood? You know, that put Christ at great risk because as an infant, depending upon Mo uh, Joseph and Mary, um, a lot of things could have happened. God went to great risk to do this. For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life? <clears throat> I thought this was all about death and resurrection. Now, people are going to say here, Paul is talking about that Christ is alive today and that saves us. I agree with that. But that's not, this is a wide open statement. We shall be saved by his life. I'm going to say that since there's no specific delineation that it, it was his life after he died, I believe, and I'm going to try to show you today, that he was, Paul was also talking about his life as a human being prior to, prior to his death. What were Christ's stated object objectives in coming to this world? He that commits sin is of the devil, for the devil sins from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested. In other words, he said, for this reason I came. What? That I could come down and die and make an exchange of my death for humanity. Wait, it doesn't say that. It says uh, that he might destroy the works of the devil. He says he came down to destroy the works of the devil. Now, we've been here for six weeks. I hope you know what the works of the devil are by now, or I've really missed the boat. What else could this be talking about except what we've spent the, la the last six lectures on? For as much then as the children are partakers of the flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. I'm going to read that again because we're going to need to, 
I want you to remember this because I can't keep flashing this text up all the time, so I'm going to read it again because I want you to get this. For as much then as the children are partakers, that's where the children, of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. Okay? Part of the same. That through death, he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. Now, help me out here. I thought Christ died as an exchange for us. And here the text says, no, it's going to destroy the devil. Or in essence, destroy what he's done, destroy his, his reputation, destroy everything that he stands for. So he's, it's going to take him out of the picture, in essence, at least for the rest of the universe concerned. I thought this was all about us. This infers that this is all about the civil war that's going on in God's kingdom with multiple other intelligences involved. Yes, he's coming to save us, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a suggestion just right now, and we're going to look at it the next three weeks. I'm just throwing this out there for you to think about, okay? God's number one goal in all of this dealing with us was not to save you and me, all as important as that is. It was to save his throne and his reputation and his kingdom, which have multiple other worlds. That was job one. We are job two. Doesn't mean we're not important doesn't mean that he wouldn't have done it just for job two. But when he's everything he's doing down here on this earth, he's got to work on job one and make sure it's taken care of and then, of course, take care of us too. So there's things he's going to be doing that are going to be surprising or we're going to question why would he do that. Remember, he's playing to a bigger audience, a much bigger audience. What were Christ's stated objectives in coming to this world? And we're just rehashing this, so we got it. To destroy both the devil and what the devil had made. That was his job one when he came. Now, here's the first thing. How is he going to destroy what the devil has done? Now we're going to talk about us. We've just talked about the big picture. Now let's come down to look at what, what this means for you and me. He's got to replace or rewrite the code that was lost through the fall. Remember we talked about ALUs. I showed you the slides where the ALUs are the mobile genetic elements that come in and they knock out code that's already there and they put themselves in its place. So a lot of information, we don't know how much, but a lot of information has been lost over the last 6,000 years. And I would point out the fact that since somewhere between 65 and 85% of our genome or our information system is now made up of foreign code, we've lost a lot. We're probably a mere caricature of what Adam and Eve looked like. We're probably, a, you know, you'd say, well, maybe they are related. I don't know. They sure don't look or act or have many characteristics the same. They all have two arms and two legs and a nose and a mouth and two eyes. We'll go with that one. But at this point, the, the uh, closeness of the resemblance starts to fade away drastically. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, said the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts. He's talking code. He's going to rewrite it. And I will be to them a God and they will be to me a people. Notice he throws that in. After we've rewritten the code, that's when the relationship's going to come. That's when the re relationship will meet its fulfillment. Does it mean you don't have a relationship going ongoing when the code is rewritten? If you don't have, we're going to find out, if you don't have a relationship going when the code is rewritten, it isn't rewritten. So it's vitally important to have a relationship or there's no rewrite. For this 
people's hearts is wax gross and their ears are dull of hearing and their eyes they have closed lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their heart and should be converted. And then look what he says. I'm quoting Christ here in Matthew 13, 15. And he's quoting Isaiah 6. I'm sorry, Isaiah 2. Not 6, Isaiah 2. Uh, and they should be, oh, it is Isaiah 6. And they should be converted. And what does it say next? I should heal them. Now we're going to get to a sticky wicket. Christ's nature. Was he pre or post fall? What do I mean by that? Did he have MGEs or not? Another way of putting it. And there is, even in our church, there's a big division on this issue. And the reason there's a big di issue is this is not some consequ inconsequential theological point that the theologians can wax eloquently on and write papers. But as far as where the rubber meets the road, it's... Its, its effect on us is minimal, as I would demurely say a lot of the theological arguments tend to be, a lot of heat and no light, but this is not one of them. This is a very important one. And why is that? Because it really rests down, it, and we're not going to go through all the arguments today as to the ramifications. We're just going to look at Christ, whether he was pre or post fall from a genetic point of view. That's what we're going to do. That's our job today. Tomorrow, next week and the week after, we're going to start looking into the ramifications. But to boil it down very simple and make broad generalizations, and I have to here because we're going to talk about this more in depth in a little bit, and I want to move on to do uh, what was, what's on the agenda for us to do today. But what it comes down to is this. If Christ was Adam pre-fall and had perfect genome with no mobile genetic elements, and then he is taking Adam's place, and so he goes through this earth, uh, his time on this earth, and he is not in any way um, cooperative with the devil, that God can then take, and I'm using some very simple language here, and we're going to get, uh, this is just to get us through the concept right now. I'll get more into this in a minute, in, in a future lecture, future lecture. For God to then be able to take Adam's DNA, or very close to it, and then in a twinkling of an eye, for instance, when Christ comes, he somehow inserts that DNA into all of his children that are waiting for him that are going to be saved. And any effort or work that they did is immaterial. Because what they're going to do is they're going to switch out motherboards. And this is a poor uh, uh, analogy, but it's the best one I can come up with. It's like we have a computer that's been completely taken over by viruses and someone comes in and says, we're going to change the motherboards and the hard drive give you brand new ones. And in this thinking, it's Christ's perfect DNA that he did not, or genome that he did not allow to be con, uh, contaminated by anything that the devil did that then can be switched out. So it's good. You should try to do what's right. You should try to follow the Ten Commandments. But at the end of the day, it's all going to get switched out anyway. All right? In order for that reasoning to, to hold, he has to be pre-fall. Because if we go to post-fall, that reasoning isn't going to work. Post-fall says, no, we've got an infected computer here. And we can't change out the motherboard and the, and the memory. Because if we do, the computer won't be the same. So much information will be lost that it will be useless. It won't be the same computer. It'll be a new computer, all right, but it won't be the one that we're trying to repair. And in order to repair that computer, we've got to go through circuit by circuit, chip by chip, and repair it. See the difference? One of them says, ah, doesn't matter. We're going to get new motherboard. We're going to get a new uh, hard drive and uh, put in some 
brand new software, we're ready to go. That requires that Christ was pre-fall. If you go, the, he has to be, we have to go circuit by circuit, chip by chip, he's got to be post-fall. And the second one requires the recipients of salvation to be actively involved. The first one, the just switching out the motherboard, only requires that they want that done, like putting in a work order. I want a new motherboard and I want a new hard drive. And then you've done it. In the Bible, it's very clear. He, call, he refers to his Father in heaven consistently. So his father, God, Christ refers to his Father as being God in heaven. And Mary, he refers to as his mother. What did he say when John, when he was on the cross and, and John, brought, John was standing there with Mary, his mother, and Mary Magdalene, and he looked at John and he said, Behold your mother. And he says, Mother, behold your son. It's very clear who he thought his mother was and who he called his mother. So if we're going to use, put this into human terminology, it says, when, and when he comes into the world, he said, sacrifice and offering you would not, but a body you have prepared me. Hebrews 10, 5, Paul's quoting Christ from Psalms. And Christ is talking to the Father. And Mary is his mother, but when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law. Now, people can argue about which law, but remember when we, I spent so much time in the first lecture, we decided that God's law was the way he set up and made things, and we looked at, and, and uh, you know, a jot nor tittle can fall from the law, except all these things be fulfilled. We looked at all of that. So, how does he make things? Well, how does he make us? We run on an information system. That was lecture two. And the laws that govern us from that information system make us who we are. So if you accept those premises that I went through in those first two lectures, this is referring to genetic law. It has to be. If it was just Jewish law, well then this Christ coming would just would be dealing with the Jewish nation, as many of our fellow religions say. Interesting to see how God works, but everything in the Old Testament really has to do with the Jews. We leave it with them. New Testament has to do with us. That, that, that type of um, uh, making a um, God work with different groups of people at different times in different ways. God used human terminology in describing how Christ became human. Using those terms, then, we can assume the following. 22 somatic chromosomes and a Y came from the Father, which would have been, came from heaven. And 22 autosomal chromosomes and an X from his mother. Remember what, what, what were we told in Luke 1 and 2 that Mary was told the Holy Spirit's going to come upon you. She says, how can I have a son? I have not known a man. And he goes, the Holy Spirit's power is going to come upon you. You are going to conceive. So if Mary's got, if she's going to conceive, and she has a, 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 a as women do, a, an egg, we call it, with 23 chromosomes, she's going to need 23 other chromosomes in order to make a human being. And it was very clear that we've gone to great lengths, the Bible, to point out that she was a virgin. And if we can do artificial insemination, insemination, insin, insemination, do you think God can? Probably. The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me, unto him ye shall hearken. This is Moses talking to the Israelites. He says to them, God's going to raise up someone just like me and you. He's not going to be different than we are. He's not going to stand out as something totally new. 
He's going to look and act and be and have the same emotions you and I have. And this is referred to in John 6, 14, uh, when they were talking to Christ, the, the priests and the rulers were talking amongst themselves. They said, then these, those men, those, those are those men, priests and uh, Pharisees and Sadducees. When they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, this is of a truth, that prophet that should come into the world. When they referred to that prophet, they were referring to Moses' statement here in Deuteronomy 18, 15. Would he be that human being that would come into the earth, the world that we're to look for. This was early on in Christ's ministry, and they were now questioning, maybe he is that one that Moses told us to be looking for. Could Christ just have looked human, but not had our information system? For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy them that had the power of death, that is the devil. Now, we looked at this text just a few moments ago, but we looked at the second part. Now, we want to go back and look at the first part. He was a partaker of flesh and blood. In order to make hemoglobin and all of the other things in our bloodstream and in order to uh, make our noses and our hands and everything else. He's going to need an information system. Otherwise, um, well, let's let's go on. And the Lord appeared to him. Uh, the, the him here is Abraham. This is in Genesis 18, 1 and 2. In the plains of Mamre. And he sat, as he, Abraham, sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. And he, Abraham, lift up his eyes and looked and saw three men stood by him. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself toward the ground. He saw three men walking up, two angels in Christ. Didn't know that. They were three men. They looked like they were in the heat of the day. They were walking by, and he wanted to go out and be hospitable to them. So he ran up and got a hold of them and said, hey, come in, refresh yourself, have something to eat and have something to drink. He thought they were human. Were they? So looking like you're human doesn't make you human. Just because they appear totally human did not make them human. Remember what our dear friend Richard Dawkins said in lecture one? What determines what an organism is is the information system, not the way it looks. Remember we talked about the fact that I could, I could put a slide up here of a, of a neuron from a mouse and I could put right next to it a slide of a neuron from a human being and you couldn't tell the difference? And what's worse is that physiologically they act the same. The only difference comes is when the way those neurons are arranged. And the way they are arranged is absolutely 100% dictated by your genome. So the information system is the important thing, not the way something looks. So Christ, if, if God is going to be telling the truth, Christ could not come to this earth and not have a human information system, or it would have been a lie. And the Bible is very clear about this. For truly he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. And I'm going to show you what seed means in a moment. We're going to, next slide is going to tell us about that. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David, according to the flesh. Now look at these. The word seed I'm going to show you in a moment has to come from the Greek word sperma, which is where we get the word spermatozoa from which is as close as the Greek's going to come to talking about gen genetics. It's whatever that magic stuff was that was able to make a human being, if, if matched up with a human female egg. That's, they knew that much, and that's, the, that's what they called it. And remember, a sperm is nothing more than a protein quote, coat with a, lots, lots of, with a genome inside of it. That's it. There's nothing more in there. You can't find something more. That's it. That's the total 
that's needed to be contributed from the man. And that's why when we were talking earlier in one of the first lectures that um, sin has to be physical because it's transferred in this, in this manner. And therefore, we would have to find sin inside of what's in that protein coat. And we found mobile genetic elements galore. They're everywhere. That one wasn't hard. We didn't have to look far. But I want you to note something here. The Bible does not say that Christ took on the seed of Adam. And it could have. And it would have had that been the case. Otherwise, God's not telling the truth. And even if it said he took on him the seed of Adam, it would have had to make clear whether it was a pre-fall or post-fall Adam because he and Eve are the only two human beings I know of that have uh, started out on the right side of the fence and went to the wrong side. I know of Elijah and Enoch who made the trip back. This is the only two I know that, that took the trip in that way. It does not say that he took on the seed of Adam. And it would have to have, if in fact God was talking about a pre-fall situation where Christ, and, and the people who, who propose this, go to Romans 5 where it says that, it, it, Paul infers that Christ is the new Adam. But he could be the new Adam in many ways. He could be the new Adam because the old Adam, through the old Adam, sin came in, and through the new Adam, sin's going to go out. And that's what Paul's saying if you read it carefully. It's the function of the two men that, that, that Paul is looking at. What function are they going to have? One of them's going to let sin in through the door and the other one's going to usher it out. It doesn't tell you how they do it. It just says they're going to, they did it. Sperma, something here, I'm just showing you the uh, Strong's Greek and Hebrew dictionaries, just to throw it up there to show you that this was not me confabulating. Could it be that Christ got all 46 chromosomes from heaven and none from Mary? Let's look at this one. Maybe that's the way this happens. This is We're trying to look at the different ways in which Christ could have had no mobile genetic elements. Okay, this is We're looking at the different possibilities and saying, do they work? For this to have happened, Christ would have had no traces of sin. He would have had, he would have, have to appeared perfect in every aspect and would have clearly stood out from everybody else. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground, and he has no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. In other words, we looked at him, we said, this can't be the Messiah. He, he's short, and he's got warts, and he looks like us. He gets tired. He's no different than we are. If this were... If this were 46 chromosomes without mobile genetic elements, well, Christ would have uh, Christ would have been 10 feet tall. He would have had absolute startling good looks and a physique that would have just absolutely knocked people's socks off. And he would have been incredible. He wouldn't have gotten tired as easily. He would have been incredibly brilliant. Not that he wasn't, but I mean to the point where people would have said, this guy, where did he come from? Because he ain't like us. It's absolutely impossible in this, from what the Bible tells us and what we know, for the idea that Christ came with all his genetic information from heaven. Number two, Mary would not have been his mother, she would have been his surrogate mother, right? And not making this very clear would be less than honest on God's part. In other words, Mary, she was just like today, couples will go and hire a surrogate mother 
to carry the sperm and the egg from the two donors. And legally, when she signs that away, she's not the mother because, you know why she's not the mother? Because the, the court looks at where the genetic material came from, and that's used to determine who parentage. Because we've had some of these surrogate mothers that go, oh, no, I think I want to keep it. They're forced to give it up on that basis. So again, information system, I keep drumming that over and over again, information system, information system, information system. There would have been no good reason to give an account of marriage lineage, Mary's lineage in Luke 3, as none of her forebearers would matter. It doesn't really matter who could have been the surrogate mother. Come on now. God could have just looked around and said, let's look for the healthiest one. We want to make sure they carry this pregnancy to term. And we wouldn't have to have gone through all that elaborate Luke 3 detail of Mary's progenitors to prove that she met all of the criteria because you see, the progenitors wouldn't count because none of their DNA is in this game. It would have all been superfluous. Maybe Christ had a human information system, but it was like Adam's pre-fall genome, no MGEs. Well, now we're saying somehow God works a miracle. Mary's the mother, but um, he works a miracle somehow, and there's no MGEs in Christ's, in Christ's DNA as it's formed. I don't care how he works it. Well, actually, I do, because if he works a miracle right, 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 right then and there, he's not under the same information system we are. And therefore, by the definitions of any biologist in this world and any scientist, he's not one of us. Once you change the information system or how it works, he's not one of us anymore. He's something else. Looks close, but he's not us. Again, Christ would have had no physical traces of sin. So we, we've gone over that. This is just a repeat. As I said, Christ would have been over 10 feet tall, and he would have um, clearly stood out. But there's another reason. It's called placental contagion. Remember when we were talking about uh, Eve and the curse that came, quote unquote curse that came when she came out of the garden? Remember Adam? First started with a snake, on your belly you will go. Then he moved on to Eve and said, in childbirth, you'll have a lot of pain. And then in Adam, he says, you're going to be tilling, tilling the soil all your life by the sweat of your brow, and you're going to be in danger of not having enough food. It's, going to, it's not going to work for you. And on that part, when I talked about, uh, this was uh, lecture four, I believe, when I talked about Eve and childbearing, we went in great depth into the fact that mobile genetic elements are responsible for the placenta and for the essential trophoblast, which is the covering on the inside of the womb. And that scientists today are convinced that uh, in humanity and the in, in evolution, that women did not bear children as they do now, because all of this stuff has come in, in evolution, evolutionary terms, relatively recently and that it's all coded by mobile genetic elements. And then remember, I showed you the slide about the placenta and the syncytial trophoblast, which make more multiplications of mobile genetic elements than any other tissue known to humankind, and that they bathe the fetus in it, and that it is impossible for the embryo, fetus, zygote, whichever, to not be entirely infected because the milieu is he, the, 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 the human to be is swimming in the stuff. And it would guarantee that any baby born of a, of a human mother would by necessity have to be totally infected with this stuff. If you're, if you're drawing blanks, go back. I believe it is lecture four. Look at it again, because I spent a lot of time on this, showing you a lot of different evidence. But I'm going to read here. It says, the close apposition of uterine and placental tissues creates a site for viral transmission from mother to fetus. By this pathway, a heterozygous ERV stands for endogenous retrovirus, which is another way of word for mobile genetic elements, in the mother could potentially colonize all of a mother's offspring 
not just the 50% that in, inherit the endogenous retrovirus by Mendelian means. What are they talking about? Well, the mother only contributes half of the genome to the new child. And so she would contribute half of, ostensibly, give or take, the mobile genetic elements. But what it's saying here is that's not, guess what? Because the mother houses the child, and this situation is set up in the placenta and the syncytial trophoblast, the child will get 100% of the mother's mobile genetic elements, not 50. If you look at this for a moment, you'd think maybe someone thought Christ was going to come, and he was going to be born of a woman, and he was going to set it up so that when Christ or whoever... When Christ would come, he would be thoroughly inoculated. You'd almost think that, wouldn't you? The system is made so error-proof. It is so 100% efficient in doing this that you can't escape it. He could not have been carried by Mary if he weren't, even if he were able to start out with a perfect genome, it wouldn't be by the time he was delivered. And if you say, well, but God could work a miracle, then we're back into the old ditch, then it's a different information system, he's not human. Would it be possible for Christ to have our post-fall condition everywhere but in his brain, which would be pre-fall? I've heard that one. There's a word, pleiotropy, which occurs when one gene influences multiple seemingly unrelated phenotypic traits, an example being phenylketonuria, which is a human disease that affects multiple systems but is caused by one gene defect. I put this up for the people who are medically inclined. I'm now going to translate this into English real briefly and tell you what this is saying. What this is saying is that each one of the protein coding areas in our DNA aren't usually used just for one tissue type. They're used throughout the body. And in this case, phenylalanine is an amino acid that we all take in in our food, if we're not. Uh, and there's a certain enzyme called phenylalanine hydroxylase, which breaks the phenylalanine down so that it can go into other metabolic pathways. If you lack that enzyme, the phenylalanine builds up in the cell, and then it starts going into other pathways that it shouldn't go into, and you start getting toxic substances. But the big thing is the phenylalanine just builds up in the cell just like trash. And the cell doesn't know what to do with it. And just like beta amyloid in the brain with Alzheimer's disease, well, Phenylalanine can do the same thing there, because guess what happens? People who had this disease before they figured out they had to limit their phenylalanine intake were mentally retarded. They had microencephaly. Their brain didn't really develop. It was filled with phenylalanine that the, the neurons choked them to death. They died. But it also does other things. It changes the sweat. It changes the smell of the urine. It changes all kinds of other body systems also have to break down phenylalanine, and they need that enzyme. And so when you have a lack of an enzyme, it doesn't just affect one organ. It affects many or all of them. And it's only coded for twice because you got one code from mom and one from dad. Therefore, the genome is now known to be one of the vast connected information system, to be one of a vast connected information system, with every protein coding area gene contributing to multiple systems. There are some genes which are only transcribed in making brain cells, but many of the genes, I'm gonna, I should have put the word most, of the genes which contain code used in making nerve cells are also used in making other organs of the body. Consequently, defects in known genes that code for nerve cells not only influence brain development, but they also, but also cells in other systems. Did you get that? There isn't any such thing as a group of genes that make the brain. So someone could go in there and just change those genes. The protein coding areas are shared throughout all of the systems. 
So if he would have a perfect brain, then he would have to have perfect rest of the other parts of the body. And then we're back into the old problem we were before, what he would be 10 feet tall, looking really handsome, smart, smart spot on and everything he did, he would stick out like a thumb, wouldn't he? Of all the different explanations, this is the one that really is the most of a non-starter. It's just totally not going to work at all. Even with a crowbar, you can't make this one fit. But now let's get to temptation. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted, like as we are, yet without sin. Why, in all things it behooved him to be made like to his brothers, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. Now this tells us that Christ came down and was tempted just like you and me, and he had to be tempted like you and me, or he couldn't make a way for us to overcome that, right? This is vital. This is extremely important. In order for Christ to be tempted as we are, he, he must have the brain circuits generated by mobile genetic elements. For as we saw in the lectures three and five, without these circuits, Christ would be totally unaffected by the temptations that beset all of us. Remember what Eve was tempted to do. She wasn't tempted to tell a lie. She wasn't tempted to believe God didn't create the garden or the trees. She wasn't tempted to get jealous about something Adam had. You know, God, you talked with Adam longer than I did the other evening. And are you being showing favoritism? I'm, kind of, I'm, kind of, I'm starting to feel a little um, envious. The devil didn't suggest any of those things. He suggested one thing to her. Would you like some new circuitry? And this new circuitry is really great stuff. God doesn't want you to have it because when you get it, remember I was a flying snake a moment ago and I didn't, couldn't talk to you and I can talk to you now. This gives you information upgrades like you can't believe. So why don't you try it? Get an information upgrade. Get some new circuitry. That's another way of talking. If you're going to talk neurophysiology, get some new circuitry. She, the temptation was to get some new circuitry. And the new circuitry, circuitry she got predisposed the behaviors that we saw in the Ten Commandments. So remember when I talked about the basal Press and receptors uh, last time around when we, on the Ten Commandments when we talked about the seventh. Remember that? I don't want to go through it all, except I want to make clear one thing. Remember, the vasopressor, the vasopressin promoter gene that had the insert of about three to 400 uh, a repeat, which is a mobile genetic element. Remember the prairie voles? It was then put in there into their... Uh, Vasopressin promoter gene area. And they became, they were monogamous. They had a great family life. Husband and wife mated for life. They loved the pups. They reared them and they were great. And if you went, you know, 20 miles away to the Montane Bowl, looked exactly the same, came from the same original ancestors not too long ago, but separated by distance geography. So they were no longer two mating populations they had become isolated from each other, that the montane bulls were promiscuous, couldn't care less about the pups. Remember that? And, and if you took those montane bulls and you genetically inserted the mobile genetic element of about 400 base pairs into their vasopressin receptor promoter region, they became monogamous. They, they got the message and they, they said, no more of this wildlife for us. We're home people. We're, we are family people. We're family oriented. They switched, it changed their behavior entirely. And someone came afterwards, up afterwards and said, well, that's a mobile genetic element. And it, 
that type of behavior would fall into what God, we would consider very much in line with what the Bible says. But what I tried to explain to you, and obviously didn't get through very well last time, so I'm going to make it real simple this time. The loss of the monogamy, which, be, which was a direct result of the loss of the vasopressor receptors, receptors in the amygdala region, was coded by a mobile genetic element, we think, and there's a lot of reasons why, but we haven't identified it yet, way further upstream, might even be on another chromosome. They haven't found it. And what happened with this mobile genetic element that happened to jump into, relatively recently, into the prairie voles, vasopressin, receptor, promoter region, frame shifted it so that whatever the distal mobile genetic element had done to erase the information or keep the information from being implemented about where to put those vasopressor receptors in the amygdala, it undid what the other mobile genetic element had done. It counteracted it. They were both mobile genetic elements, all right? The first one made the voles promiscuous. The second one came in and frame shifted the reading of the DNA so the information was accessible again. It was accidental. The second, the one that we see in the receptor region of the, the, of the voles that makes them monogamous just undid the work of another mobile genetic element upstream. Okay, it counteracted it. And we find this all the time in mobile genetic elements. For instance, if you are infected with two viruses at the same time, or even five or six, guess what they do? They send out chemicals to stop the other viruses from being able to, to replicate. And the one that gets the most viruses in is able to stop the others so that it will win and only it ends up replicating in the cell and taking it over. They fight amongst themselves all the time. Their common goal is to take over the genome and they work with each other when it's useful for them. But when it comes down to it, they all work to, to be the top dog between themselves. So it's not uncommon for them to undo the work of another mobile genetic element. Because they're not only warring against you, they're warring against each other. They want to be top dog. And who does that sound like? Who do you think would have come up with that scheme? Now we're going to look at something else here. We're going to look at the antigen receptors. And I'm going to tell a quick story. When I was in medical school, I was a senior, and what often happened is certain um, disciplines, like internal medicine in this case, would see a medical student that they liked, and they would court them, and they'd say, hey, why don't you think about being an internist? Because we like the way you performed as an extern here on taking your um, clerkship with us. And I was going through internal medicine, and it, the head of endocrinology came up to me and said, um, I would really like you to think about going into endocrinology. We want to add more staff. I would like to groom you, send you off, blah, blah, blah. And I said, well, I don't know. Because when you, from a medical point of view, when you talk about the dazzling specialties, neurosurgery, or you know, uh, invasive cardiology, no one ever says endocrinology. <laughs> it doesn't happen. There's no spice to that when you're dealing with diabetics and thyroid disease, and, and it's, um, it's a housekeeping function more than anything, really. But he says, oh, I'm going to tell you a story. I'm going to show you how interesting this is. So he told me this story. He says, uh, about a year ago, a woman came into my office, and she came with her husband, and she said, my husband is not being romantically attentive to me as he should be. And she goes, we, 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 I think something's very wrong, and I want you to look into this. So that's endocrinology. So this professor did the proper exam, uh, blood work, and it came back. And sure enough, he had almost, well, it was detectable, but barely, testosterone level. He says, I got good news for you. I think we can take care of this very easily. We're going to put him on testosterone shots. Start him on testosterone shots. Didn't see him back. So he's thinking, okay, everything is going pretty well here. And about seven or eight months after they had been in his office, the wife books an appointment. So he's thinking, mm, maybe she's got diabetes or thyroid disease. Good, come on in. And she comes in and she says, 
I'm very angry at you. And he said, why? He goes, my husband just ran off with the secretary. <laughs> now, prior to that occurring, if you had been looking at this gentleman, totally faithful to his wife, wouldn't you if you said if he, his name came up to be an elder in the church? Absolutely. The problem was, in order for temptations to work, you need the circuitry and you need the chemical environment. If you're missing either one of those, it doesn't work. He had the circuitry all right. We found that out after seven months on testosterone. So temptations, in order to be temptations, his secretary obviously didn't tempt him. Prior to that, she'd been his secretary for years. You need the right equipment for the temptations to work. And if you don't have those temptations, I mean, if you don't have that circuitry, you don't have the temptations. Molecular cell biology, antigen receptor signaling, and it says the human antigen receptor is located on the X chromosome. All right. Well, you could say, well, the Y chromosome came from God, so therefore it could have had the right information so that Christ would not have been tempted in this area. But the trouble is, without going through a long explanation, the entire androgen, which is another name for testosterone, testosterone is androgen, the entire system I've just talked to you about is inherited from the mother on the X chromosome. The Y chromosome up, up regulates the testosterone, which then fires up the information on the X chromosome so that he becomes a male and he acts like a male. If there isn't any testosterone that's fired up because there's no Y chromosome, the baby automatically becomes a female. But all the information, the circuitry, is housed on the X chromosome. The Y just brings in the signal more testosterone, and that then combines with a special protein called the antigen receptor and goes into the nucleus of that little baby, and it actually changes the way the DNA is set up and the way the histones, the protein coats that, that, that go around. It makes the quote, protein coats lock up the parts that would make the baby look secondary sex characteristics, make her look female, and it opens up the ones that make them look male. But that's all coded for from mom, not from dad. So Christ's, if he looks like a male, which he did, he had a beard, remember? They pulled it out and Pilate's waiting to, for going in. All of that information came from mom. And we saw her lineage, didn't we? There's David who had one of his best friends killed so he could get her wife, get his wife. Uriah, remember that story? Remember it said specifically he was of the lineage of David? These are all the different systems in the body that the androgen receptor has an influence on. If Christ had a perfect antigen receptor, he would have looked markedly different because it affects almost every one of the systems in the body. You can't get around this one. Androgens not only significant contribute to several aspects of central nervous system development, circuit formation and function, and resistance against noxious impact, but also help to maintain its proper function in adulthood. So not only does it make the little baby a male, it keeps the baby a male throughout its lifetime. It's a continual, continually acting function. And I won't go through there, except to say, you see this, the role of antigen receptors in the masculinization of the brain and behavior. That is coded for by mom. It just needs the testosterone to trigger it so it goes into effect. You know, I'm going to say something about mothers here. 
I'm going to pay tribute to them. Who was it that said that the, the hand that rocks a cradle rules the world? That's a true statement. So much more information is carried through you folks than comes through the male lineage. You have a greater responsibility. Not only do you have a greater ability, but you have a greater responsibility for the future of mankind because what you carry and pass on, we all change the information system that's been given us. We all modify it for good or for bad. Your effect is going to be much stronger from a genetic point of view than the father of your children. Here's the other thing. They've done this experiment over and over again. If you have a, a method of sexual reproduction between in, in a species and you introduce a mobile genetic element into it, it quickly goes throughout the species. Why? Because when the component comes in from the mom or the dad, if they're carrying that mobile genetic element, it quickly jumps to the others at the chromosome. That's why they call them jumping genes, remember? Again, you'd almost think someone had figured this out and was planning. It's just so coincidental. I love it. Um, so if half the gen genome came from heaven and half came from Mary, it's all infected. For he made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. To me now, that makes very clear. Very, makes all the sense. Knowing what we know now, that can only mean that Christ had MGMs, just MGEs like the rest of us. And this is a quote from A.T. Jones. And it says, and that this is likeness to man as he is in his fallen sinful nature and not as he was in his original sinless nature is made certain by the word. We see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. Therefore, as man is since, therefore man is, since he became subject to death, this is what we see Jesus to be in his place as man. Therefore, just as certainly we see Jesus lower than the angels unto the suffering of death, so certainly it is by this demonstrated, it is by this demonstrated that, as man, Jesus took the nature of man as he is since death entered, and not the nature of man as he was before he became subject to death. What A.T. Jones is saying here is, is Christ couldn't have died if he didn't have our information system because Adam's pre-fall wasn't subject to death. If Christ is going to die, he's got to have a system that allows death. Before man sinned, he was not in any sense subject to sufferings. And for Jesus to have come in the nature of man as he was before sin entered would have been only to come in a way and in a nature in which it would be impossible for him to know the sufferings of man and therefore impossible to reach him to save him. But since he, it became him in bringing men unto glory to be made perfect through sufferings, he's referring there to Hebrews 5, I believe it's 9 and 10. And there's also one in Hebrews Two, I believe it's 10, where it talks specifically about this. I'm trying to keep the number of slides down because the more slides I have, the more verbose I get. So I'm trying to help myself that way. It, it is certain that Jesus became man, by, Jesus in becoming man partook of the nature of man as he is since he became subject to suffering, even the suffering of death, which is the wage of sin. A.T. Jones, the consecrated way to Christian perfection. I lifted this right out of there. If we had had time today and we don't, I was going to give you a little talk about the fact that there is some suggestion that because mobile genetic elements have so greatly infected the G-coupled proteins, remember we talked about those having to do with the curse given to Eve, quote unquote curse, and how it set up the cycle in Eve and all that sort of thing. Go back and re review that. Uh, that. That would be a lecture... Five, I think. Um, but there's a suggestion now that the pain receptors that we have are pain weren't always pain receptors. 
but due to the mobile genetic elements, they've been changed in configuration to become pain receptors. And that's why it says in the new earth there will be no pain there. And we have no talk about pain in, in uh, Eden. So for Christ to experience pain, if this is true, and I said if, we can't prove this by any means, you know that. It's, it's a suggestion looking at the genetics and seeing how things have been abridged that the pain receptors weren't always pain receptors. And maybe the reason they didn't need pain receptors in heaven is because, you know, that robe of light that surrounds everyone? Maybe that's like a force field or something that keeps you from being damaged. I don't know. I'm guessing. I'm just throwing stuff out to think about. And when that's gone, now we need to have pain because guess what happens if you don't have pain? Remember those pictures of leprosy I showed you? Because that's the reason why their fingers and hands eat away is they don't have any pain. And so they start using their hands like a hammer and like a, a chisel and they, it, and they hold their hand in the fire. It doesn't hurt. And they get the burns and the open sores. So we have to have pain in order we would have no humanity without it. And that's what Christ was telling Eve. Guess what? You've got a new system coming, and pain's going to be an integral part of the system. And I didn't code for it. Someone else coded for it. It's coming in, but I'm letting, it go. I'm letting that code go through because without it, there won't be any humanity to survive. If Christ is going to experience pain, and he did on the cross... He told us so. He would have to have the receptors to register it, wouldn't he? And he would have to have the CNS circuitry to register it, wouldn't he? You can't have it both ways. There's no halfway mark here. Either he had mobile genetic elements or he didn't. And then you have to look at his life and say, what, what, what? what? And looking at his life, what do we find? And we find 100% consistency that he had to have had them. I could continue to beat this dead horse. I'm not going to. But we could look at other areas. This isn't, these are just the first ones. There's others that we can look at. If we're going to take the story as written, there's only one way, using genetics. Of course, you can say, oh, that's science. But using genetics, you can only come to one conclusion, in my opinion. And I'm very open for someone else to show me a way around this if they can. He became, uh, Christ begins our salvation under attack. And Jesus, being full of the Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led to the Spirit into the wilderness, being 40 days tempted of the devil. And in those days he did eat nothing. And when they were ended, he was afterward hungry. Temptation number one, and the devil said to him, If you be the Son of God, command these stones to be made bread. There's three main temptations he has. I'm going to suggest to you there are three main circuitry systems in the brain that the devil has set up. And he's, he hits all three of them, one at a time. And he starts with the one that's most successful. Time won't allow us. I knew that, and it's complicated, but I will just say that the number one drive we have is to eat. Okay, and it's hooked up to the nucleus of humans because if we don't eat, we, we don't live. So God has set up the circuitry in our system so that we will eat. And you may say, well, that's foolish. No, it's not. When I was uh, eight years old, I was one summer day. It was in Redfield, South Dakota, and we don't have many summer days. And I decided with my friend we were going to go on a hike. And we saw an elevated hill. It was about 300 feet above the plane, so you could see we could see it for five miles away. We didn't know it was five miles. We said, let's take a hike over to that hill, see what we can see. So we ate breakfast, and my mom made me a sack lunch, which had two little peanut butter sandwiches in it and some carrots and celery, and we head off with our bags. We were going to do a pilgrimage to that and be back by one or two in the afternoon. Well, it was five miles, and we got... Um, distracted by other things, and then on the way home, we got lost, and I didn't get home till about 6 o'clock, and I'd eaten my sack lunch at about 10.30 in the morning because we said, hey, let's, let's, we're kind of getting hungry. Let's see what we got, okay? But as I got home, a couple of my other friends says, hey, we're going to go play Dare Base. And I thought, Dare Base, that's, the, that's my number one favorite game, and you can only play that in the summertime in South Dakota. And I said, count me in, and we went over in a got a bunch of guys in this field and we started playing dare base and soon it got dusk and that's even more fun. And then we added pump pump pull away 
And before I knew it, it, I had lost track of time. I went wandering home, and as I walked home, no lights were on, and I thought, oh, that's not good. <laughs> and I walked in thinking maybe everyone's asleep and I'll be very quiet. And I heard a deep voice that, go, that goes, Bob, where have you been? Now, if I'm in favor with the parentage, it's Bobby. When I'm not in favor, it's Bob. <laughs> I knew right then and there, things weren't going to go well. I, that's the only time in my life I got a strapping. Not the only time I deserved a strapping, but the only time I got caught, okay? It was 12.30 in the morning. I had completely lost, tra lost track of time, and I, one of the questions to me was, weren't you hungry? No, I was having fun. If God doesn't put a system in to remind us to eat, and it's got to be a very basic system, and it's got to make sure we eat. If he doesn't put one in, probably not going to have humanity around for too long. So it's a critical core. Well, that, this drive to eat is exactly what the devil makes new circuitry that piggybacks onto and takes control of, and we, we see them as addictions. And God said to the devil, if thou be the son of God, command these stones that they be made bread. Remember when we said 40 days? Well, I have a paper that talks about the fact that the hunger drive for hunger peaks at 40 days. And at that point, people become unreasonable in their desire to get food. And if you go past 40 days, people die. And so they do fasts now, and they give them water, and they give them other things to do. And at first, they're not hungry, and everything is fine. And in some people, they never get the hunger back because they are left in a laying position. They rest them. But if you're out moving, your blood sugar gets just abnormally low. And we were told he was in the wilderness being test, te tempted for 40 days, right? I don't think there's a lot of places to lounge around in, on stones. Uh, what I'm getting at is if you want to peak out this drive, you peak it out at 40 days. So Christ is having to pick up at 40 days under the absolute worst conditions. Now we're going to test the system. And he's told to make some bread. Why not? You're hungry. And if you were the son of God, I'm sure God would want you to eat. This is unhelpful, man. You should be eating. This temptation encompassed all the MG-derived brain circuitry, which piggyback into the food reward system, ending in the pleasure center of the brain, the nucleus of humans. Drugs, smoking, alcohol, sex, gambling, and of course food are good examples. The circuitry here is triggered by environmental factors, primarily, some are internal, but primarily it's external factors, working through complex circuits that compel their victims to acquiesce. This system does something very interesting. They've proven it with alcohol and with drugs like uh, cocaine and amphetamine. What it does is it not only sets up its own circuitry that dovetails right in at the end where the food comes into the nucleus of cumin so it can trigger that circuitry so you get the pleasure response that you would get if you were absolutely starved and now got some food. But it does something else very interesting. It breaks down the circuits coming in from the prefrontal cortex and the frontal cortex. It quarantines this part of the brain, which is the, the brain stem or the midbrain, so that the areas, the prefrontal cortex and the cortex are where we do our thinking, our critical thinking. That's where we do our, uh, where we decide what we're going to do and not do. It's isolated. So what happens with these addicts will tell you is, yeah, I saw the cocaine on the table, and I said to myself, quick, turn around. You don't want to have anything to do with this. And my body kept walking right over toward it. I picked it up and snorted it. And all the time I was saying, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. Very bad stuff. And the one that does this more than all of them is smoking, the nicotine receptors in the brain, muscarinic receptors. They completely break down the ability of the prefrontal and frontal cortex to inhibit behavior. It isolates it. And that's why smoking is just so difficult for people to break. Because the, the system that says no in the individual can't 
can't stop the behavior. It can sit there yelling on the sidelines, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it, but the person goes ahead and does it. Self-glorification. When the, then when the devil takes him up into a holy city and sets him on a pinnacle of the temple, and he said to him, if you be the son of God, cast yourself down, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge concerning you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest at any time you dash your foot against a stone. The Jews are expecting the Messiah to come and present himself to the nation by standing up on the pinnacle of the temple, floating in the air right next to it. And then he was going to slowly uh, float down to the earth. And when he hit the earth, the chief priest and the scribes and rulers were to meet him there and, and acknowledge him in front of all Israel that this was that prophet that Moses talked about in 1850. This was a commonly held belief at the time. And so what the devil was saying to Christ was, hey, let me tell you something. Yeah, I am the devil. I'm, I'm, I am your adversary. But let me, I'm actually a nice guy. You've heard a lot of bad things about me, and I'm going to help you out. The way you're going to go about this trying to get humanity to listen to you is not going to work. I know I've been working with these people for 4,000 years. I will tell you what you need to do. I'm, I'm, it's very simple. I'm just here to help. I can transport you up there on top of the, by the top pinnacle of the, of the temple, and I'll make a noise so that people start gathering down below. Someone will go get the chief priest and, the, and the, the high priest, and then, and he quotes Psalms 91, he says, then all you have to do, because you are the son of God, right? I mean, you say you are. Just, I'll let you go, and you float down. They'll listen to anything you have to say after that because they're not going to buy what you're saying now. I know the way you've been living, and it ain't going to go. It's not going to fly. You need to get the people to realize who you are and how important you are. That was a second group of, of circuitry. We all are tempted, aren't we? Well, I should say, don't we all engage in the activity of self-promotion? Why do you buy a fancy car? Well, yes, it's for performance when you're getting on the freeway, but that's a very small percentage of the time that you're driving the car. And why do you have it waxed and detailed? And drive in at the most opportune time when your friends are most likely to see it? We all do it, so if to claim that's accidental is just not going to fly. And we could go on from there. Go look at Hollywood. They have perfected this to a high art form. That was triggered. It was, the idea was to trigger the self-glorification circuitry. Temptation three, non-cause and effect circuitry. And again, the devil takes him up to an exceeding high mountain and shows him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And he said to him, all these will I give you if you will fall down and worship me. This temptation was calculated to trigger the easy way out circuitry, which abandoned all reality requirements. What the devil says was, okay, all right, now let me tell you something. Let's get rid of all this other stuff we've been talking about. It's peripheral. Let's get down to where the rubber meets the road. I made the mobile genetic elements. I put them in. I know how they work. Here's the deal we're going to make. I kind of like you. I think that uh, this idea that you have this three and a half years of uh, having to deal with what's coming, and let me tell you something, friend. This is an opening salvo. I got plenty more. If you think this is rough, <laughs> this is kindergarten. We're just starting. I got a lot of things. I've been waiting for you for 4,000 years. I got a lot of things in my, in my bag of tricks. You don't have to do it. I'm going to make it simple on you. Guess what? I've gotten tired of these human beings. They're a miserable lot. You can have them. All you have to do is bow down to me, and in, the, in return, I will give you all the information to remove that code. They will become part of the family of heaven again. You guys can go off. You can have them. I tell you, they're, they're a worthless lot, but if you want them, fine. Go ahead. Take it. All you have to do is bow down. Five seconds, all right? Just acknowledge that I was pretty smart when I made those mobile genetic elements, and we're done. Oh, by the way, you know your death is going to really be something special. I really wouldn't want to do that if I were you. I, 
I, it, it's, it's gruesome. Let's not even go there. Just take my word for it. You don't want to go there. It's simple. Bow down right now. We're done. It was non-reality, though, because, you see, the devil couldn't have had no way of pulling all this stuff out. He, he put it in, but the problem is, is it takes someone much more smarter than he to even have attempted to, to reclaim these infected genetic genomes and make them function well again. Far beyond his expertise. But at that point, when you're tired and it's a temptation to say, yeah, I know it's not exactly right, but close enough for government work. Let's just do it. If Christ messes up here, because what he's saying is cause and effect don't matter. If cause and effect don't matter, then guess what? Without cause and effect, you can't have free will. And without free will, all of the things we hold near and dear, including love, affection, um, creativity, the ability to have tomorrow different than what today is, disappear. Everything was riding on that. He stumbles on any one of these three, by the way. He's, we're done. We're done. There's not gonna, he's not going to be able to do anything for us. He's got to break these three circuitries before he starts. If he doesn't break the back of them, he's got nothing to offer us. All three categories of MG. A brain circuitry cannot function in reality and consequently produce destructive consequences. You are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and stayed not in the truth. Remember, we define truth as reality. Remember that lecture one? Remember what Aristotle said? Truth is that which is. So what Christ is saying here is the devil, you're not even functioning in that which is. You're not functioning in reality. Because there is no truth, there is no reality in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks his own, for he's a liar and he's a father of lies. Defective circuits produce defective results. Making it impossible for you and I to function in in the day-to-day -day of reality that we deal with. So we have to curb we, we, we realize that our mind tells us to go ahead. Push yourself first in line. And then you remember, well, the last time I did that, someone did it to me and it turned ugly and maybe I shouldn't do it. The urge to go first in line is a defective thought process. But we are dealing with those defective thought processes all the time. And if we didn't have the Bible and the Ten Commandments to tell us they were defective, we just do them. We're curbing them all the time. Christ refuted the devil by making statements of reality. Remember his word? Remember lecture one equals reality? We went through that whole algorithm. You need to look up lecture one and go through it again. I'm not going to take time today. It is written. He quoted the devil. It is written. Why? Because we said God's word was a statement of reality. Remember that? So what God is saying to the devil, he's refuting him by saying, in this way he showed the temptations to have no basis in reality. What he was telling to the devil is, you are playing in fantasy land. I'm not going to have anything to do with it. When we utilize those three different sets of circuitry, we too are playing in fantasy land. And that's why we the results can be and are so detrimental and at times downright horrible. The brain circuitry that still responds to God operates in reality and consequently produces productive output. Mobile genetic element controlled circuits are so defective that they cannot operate in reality. And that's why you see horrible things like what happened in Connecticut with the shooting of the children. What, how in the world would that have anything connection to what his gripe was? His mother wasn't spending time with him. You see, that's the sign of a mobile genetically controlled circuitry brain thinking. But this one wasn't checked. He didn't check it. He let it, he carried it through. Okay, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, 
that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me and I in you. And the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him. The same bringeth forth much fruit for without me you can do nothing. Remember that? John 15. I'm going to, it's at the end today because we're going to, I was going to do microRNAs today. We'll have time. So we're going to end up with this part. I'll pick up the slides I was going to use on microRNAs today next time since it folds right into what we need to talk about next time, which is Christ's death. We're talking about his life today. Next week we talk about his death. Um, systemic acquired silency. Um, what happens is, and I'm going to cut through a lot of this and just make it simple. We're going to have some generalization. They did experiments back in the 1990s with tomato plants. And what they wanted to find out was, how is it that some of the tomato plants would get infected with a virus, and they could take a, a stem of the a tomato plant, and they could graft it onto another plant, which was for some reason immune to that virus. And the, the graft, uh, which was infected and dying in the first tree, which was having the disease, once you grafted it into the second, the disease disappeared, and it produced great tomatoes. And they were thinking, well, how could we find a way to increase our our crop production. Let's see if we can find what it is that enables us to graft a, a, a stem from an infected tomato plant into one that's not and have it be cured. What is it? How do they do it? If we can find out, maybe we can market it. And, it, and what they found, if you notice here, NS is not silenced. In other words, they talked about a transgene, which is a, a, any type of genetic material that comes in from the outside. Think of it as being transferred in, okay, transgene. The NS stands for not silenced. So in this plant, that gene, and let's just for argument say that it makes a protein that kills the plant. In reality, what it does is it makes proteins, which makes the plant less productive and small and the fruits poor. And But let's just, so we can get the concept, let's dictate but for stipulate for this discussion that that's the case. They will kill the plant, the non-silenced one, the black one. What they do is they take the top sprig and they put it onto a silenced plant. They haven't figured out why it's silenced plant, why it's silenced yet. And guess what happens? The nine scion is really the another name for the transplanted bra uh, branch. It is uh, it's non-silenced and it's put on a silenced stock. And guess what happens? It becomes silenced. It, it's healed, works normally. So they said, well, how is that? According to the concept of systemic acquired silencing, we can distinguish two partners, the source, which is the, which is the plant that has somehow found a way to silence this genetic material, and the target or the scion, which is, comes from the plant that it's not silenced, and you're trying to, to salvage that branch, and you're putting it onto the plant that is silenced, what are the requirements for these two partners to play their roles? Well, I'm not going to go through everything here. I'm just going to tell you what, ha what needs to happen. The original plant, they found out, that does not have, that has the transgene, but it's silenced, they found out that it has acquired some microRNAs which silence the new gene that comes in. And it can do it two ways. It can actually shut down the gene or it can take, when the gene has its part transcribed, it grabs onto the microRNA and renders it impotent, so it can't do anything. Either way, it's like the gene isn't there, right? If you either shut the gene down so it can't transcribe, or as soon as it transcribes, you've got these microRNAs waiting right there for it to lock it up so it can't work anymore. It doesn't matter. It's as if you don't have the problem. And what they did found is, is that if they connected they went over to a, a neighboring plant that hadn't come up with a system yet to shut down that foreign gene, and you take a sprig from it and put it onto the top of this one, that the microRNAs that come from the stem where this happens go up into that new grafted part. In order to be grafted now, it has to have access to the phloem that's coming up from the plant, the fluid that comes up just under the bark. 
and, and, and that's how plants get their nutrients up to the leaf. You know, have you ever wondered how they get it from the roots? Well, it goes up through a, a very elaborate system to get it up there. So if these microRNAs come from the stem and they go up through that fluid, and if, it's, if the graft is connected correctly to the stem, the fluid goes into the graft, into the, into the microRNAs go into this infected graft and silence the gene that's there. In order for this to work, the original plant where the gene is silenced had to have had exactly the same infection as the, as the plant that you're now going to take the stem, uh, take the uh, branch and graft it. They have to have exactly the same genetic material in both that's causing the problem. And it had to have been active in the plant that silenced it, and it found a way to silence it. It had to have been active for this to work. And only as long as that top sprig is in contact with the, with the stem will it remain disease-free. If you take it and put it back onto the original plant, which still has the disease, gone, dead. I think Christ knew exactly what he was talking about when he used this. He, therefore, has to have our disease in order to provide a way, a cure for it, and we have to be hooked up to him in order to realize it. The minute we're not hooked up to him, we're gone. This is easily, easily demonstrated. This is not rocket science. I could have taken longer to show you the ins and outs of it. It's very clear. It's very direct. If Christ gave this very same, this very uh, example himself, he had to have known that in order for the plant to work this way, it had to have had the original disease itself, the silencing plant, or it doesn't happen. And the minute you lose that connection, the, the minute that plant, the, the grafted part, loses its connection with the original stem, it dies. And here's one other interesting thing they found. They could take up to 30 centimeters and put in a wild stock stem, just a, a regular, that didn't have this transgene at all. It was a, another tomato plant from another area, and they just bring in, and they actually grafted in on top of the roots this 30 centimeters of a regular plant. But right, be, right at the bottom, right above the roots, they left the stem where this is where the plant develops its defense against the uh, foreign DNA that comes in. They left that. Then they had a 30 centimeter, which is long for tomato plants, uh, of a regular, non infected stem. And then they did the transplantation from the infected plant onto the top, and it still worked. It works from a distance. That stem is the equivalent of the Holy Spirit, the 30 centimeter add-on. See how it works? Pretty straightforward. Pretty incredible. And he could have picked anything as an example. He didn't have to pick this. And if he picks this, we are definitely locked into just what I told you. Now, next time, we're going to go into microRNAs. And uh, I'm going to leave you with two texts to think about. It says, for the life of, of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it over to you on the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes an atonement for the soul. And therefore, I said to the sons of, Levi, of Israel, no soul of you shall eat blood, neither shall any stranger that is staying among you eat blood. For it is the life of all flesh, its blood is for the life of it, and therefore I said to the sons of Israel, you shall not eat the blood of any flesh, for the life of all the flesh is in the blood, whoever eats it shall be cut off. The blood, remember, and I'm going to show you next week, the blood is what carries the most of the microRNAs. It's the system that distributes it throughout the body. Without the microRNAs, you can't be alive, I can't be alive, because it's the ultimate way that 120 trillion cells constantly are tweeting each other, and they're exchanging these microRNAs and other genetic equivalents constantly in the bloodstream. It's loaded with them. 
And that's why when you eat meat, you eat your rare steak, you're getting all of this from the animal. And it's going into your DNA, and it's telling your DNA to do what the animal's DNA was being told by the animal as it was being strangled. And special microRNAs are put out when the organism is dying. We could spend a lot of time on this. We won't. This isn't a diet talk. Now, I want you to think about something. When it says that Christ's blood saves us, does that add a new dimension? It should. We'll do it next time. Let's have prayer. Our Father, we thank you for the elaborate ways you have put information into your word. That those of us who want to dig and look for it, the Holy Spirit will guide and we will see the marvelous plan of salvation you have provided for us. May we be your amb ambassadors today. Amen.